Good evening. I'm Spot on Weather meteorologist Matthew Euler, and tonight I am going to cover the ocean and weather. The ocean has a huge role as this large heat reservoir, and it plays significantly into the weather overall. So we will delve into the different aspects of the ocean, which tie into the weather in tonight's video. Here's a great shot on the cover slide of some pretty significant wind waves uh, generated by a storm system of some sort here. Uh, when that wind energy passes over these water, this water surface, these wind waves are generated. In addition, there's other types of waves out there that are known as swell waves for more distant storms. So let's jump right into tonight's video. The first thing I want to start off with in tonight's video is there's a difference between surface currents and deep currents. For surface currents, they typically are wind-driven. And their primary motion is going to be horizontally. While deep currents are driven by these differences in density, which is caused by those changes in temperature and salinity. And the deep currents, um, if you note there, they include both vertical and horizontal motions in the ocean. Here's a great example of the different uh, wind belts and surface current movements. Uh, if we look at both the northern and southern hemisphere for the Atlantic Ocean, uh, generally around 30 degrees north and south latitude, this particular area is dominated by an area of subtropical high pressure. Now, wind around high pressure systems in the northern hemisphere tends to blow in a clockwise manner, similar to the hands of the clock on the wall there in your home or your office. Whereas the circulation around high pressure systems at 30 degrees south latitude in the southern hemisphere tend to blow counterclockwise or against the flow of the hands of a typical clock you would see. Now, why is this important? This huge, broad, subtropical high pressure belt over the Atlantic Ocean is just one example of how the wind generally follows this clockwise and counterclockwise motion. And that wind imparts energy to the ocean surface, resulting in a gyre or a ocean current circulation in this particular ocean basin. We're using the Atlantic Ocean. So you can kind of get a look to see how the wind belts kind of play into the general motion of these surface currents in the ocean. Um, just, uh, just wanted to mention this briefly in this graphic. The, uh, lighter, the lightest green arrows there represent the trade winds, which generally blow from the northeasterly direction in the northern hemisphere and from the southeasterly direction in the southern hemisphere. That's the lighter green arrows. The darker green arrows represent the prevailing middle latitude westerlies in both the northern and southern hemisphere. And then the blue arrows indicate those ocean surface currents. So just wanted to show how the wind, that circulation around these large gyres, plays into the movement of ocean currents. So now let's move in a little bit more into surface currents. Now if you notice this particular globe, this graphic, um, the ocean currents, as well as those pressure belts, are disrupted by land masses. And these land masses come into um, play as far as um, not allowing the ocean currents to go unimpeded from west to east, let's say, in the mid latitudes in the northern hemisphere. Um, instead, these ocean currents are going to create this circular gyre pattern. All right, so. Distribution of continents is huge and influences the flow in each ocean basin as far as the ocean currents go. And one thing again as a reminder from a previous training video I did, um, the northern hemisphere is composed of 60% landmass, 40% water, and the southern hemisphere is the opposite. It's only 40% um, landmass and 60% water. So the southern hemisphere is influenced much more by water as compared to the northern hemisphere due to that land water distribution. Now there's other current influences um, that definitely impact these currents. This includes gravity, 
friction. As the wind imparts energy to the ocean surface, there is friction, which acts opposite to the direction of motion of the wind. And then there's also the Coriolis effect. So let's talk about these subtropical gyres. Now, these gyres are these large circular loops of moving water. Um, subtropical gyres are centered, as I mentioned, around 30 degrees latitude, both in the northern and southern hemisphere. And these subtropical gyres are bounded by, on the south, the equatorial current, uh, to the western ocean basins by these western boundary currents. And then to the north of these subtropical gyres or high pressure systems, are northern or southern boundary currents, as well as eastern boundary currents, okay? And I will show you a map here to kind of show you how this works. There are five subtropical gyres that are existent in existence. These include the North Atlantic gyre. Sometimes we refer to this as the Columbus gyre. The South Atlantic gyre, which is known as the Navigator gyre. The North Pacific gyre, known as the Turtle gyre. The South Pacific gyre, known as the Heyerdahl gyre, and then the Indian Ocean, the Majid gyre. So there's five subtropical gyres. Here's a great graphic now to kind of give you a look at the different types of currents that exist around these subtropical gyres at 30 degrees north and south latitude, both the northern and southern hemisphere. Um, so as I already showed you the Atlantic, they have this huge of gyre of ocean currents. We're actually throwing the names of these currents now onto the graphic. Now the red arrows indicate warm currents and the blue arrows indicate cold currents. And so we generally have a clockwise flow of the current system around those high pressure or subtropical gyres in the northern hemisphere and a counterclockwise circulation of ocean currents around these subtropical gyres there at 30 degrees south latitude there in the southern hemisphere. And so you'll note blue indicates colder currents, again and red indicates warmer currents. So let's just take a look out in the Pacific Ocean in the northern hemisphere. Um, some of the major currents we have that influence the weather greatly uh, include the California current there along the coast of California. And you'll notice the clockwise flow then becomes the north equatorial current and then the Kuroshio current in the Western Pacific Ocean plays a significant role, especially when it comes to typhoon tracks, as well as extratropical winter storms, which can be quite um, strong off the coast of Japan, as an example. And then you have the Oyashio current coming in from um, the northern areas there. It's the colder current that flows southward generally. And then finally, to close the North Pacific subtropical gyre, we have the North Pacific current. Now you will notice there is a little spin-off of the North Pacific Current uh, that works its way along the Pacific Northwest, along the west coast of Canada, into the Gulf of Alaska. That is known as the Alaskan Current. Uh, so you get the subtropical gyre there. And the Atlantic Ocean, the current system around the gyre is the colder Canary Current, which flows uh, north to south along the coast of Spain, down off the coast of northwestern Africa. That becomes the North Equatorial Current, which is a warm current flowing from um, Africa towards the Caribbean. And then you have the Gulf Stream Current, which is very critical to East Coast weather. Um, it's a very warm current, one of the fastest moving currents in the world. And finally, you have the North Atlantic Current. You can also take a look at some of the other notable currents here on this graphic. Uh, for the South Pacific subtropical gyre there at labeled at 0.2, as well as the South Atlantic gyre labeled at 0.4, and finally the Indian Ocean subtropical gyre at 0.5. Now one of the more major currents that we talk about, one of the more significant currents, that actually flows from west to east uninterrupted is known as the Antarctic Circumpolar Current or the West Wind Drift. Uh, if you notice the blue arrows at the bottom of this diagram, the colder current there, with the west wind drift. Uh, generally there is no land masses. I talked about the continents and how they disrupt the flow of these ocean currents and the wind systems. But down there, um, just north of Antarctica, you have this west wind drift, which there's no continents in the way, so it's very strong and it flows from generally a west to east direction. All right, so we're going to get a little bit more now into discussion on the various currents associated with the subtropical gyre. We'll start with the equatorial currents. These include both north and south equatorial currents, 
And they generally travel westward along the equator. And again, if we go back here and we want to take a look at those equatorial currents, you can see them denoted in the red coloring. Right in the vicinity of the equator, just north of it in the northern hemisphere and just south of it in the southern hemisphere. Okay. Next, we will discuss the western boundary currents. Now, the western boundary currents uh, carry warmer waters from the equatorial regions northward. Um, western edge of ocean basins in general is where you'll find these uh, western boundary currents. So warmer waters from equatorial regions carry northward. All right, so these western boundary currents, um, we'll move on now to the northern and southern boundary currents where we see easterly water flow across the ocean basin. The northern boundary currents in the northern hemisphere and the southern boundary currents, they're, they're, they're definitely existent in the southern hemisphere as well. And then we'll talk about the cooler eastern boundary currents that direct cooler water from the north towards the south. So if we go back to our, our globe map here, the currents, the Gulf Stream and the Kuroshio current in the northern hemisphere will be an example of a, a western ocean boundary current carrying warmer water from the equatorial areas north, while the Canary Current, as well as the California Current off the coast of California, those would be considered eastern boundary currents. And there are similar types of currents in the southern hemisphere. If you look at the Peruvian cur uh, current there off the coast of South America, the west coast of South America, uh, you also have the East Australian Current, which is a warm current. Um, that is going to be a western boundary current there off the east coast of Australia. And then you have the Brazilian current off the east coast of Africa, um, excuse me, South America. The Algulhas is the one I was thinking of there off the coast, uh, southeast coast of Africa. But you'll see, you'll notice that uh, generally along the east coast of the continents, the east coast of the continents or the western boundaries of the gyres, there are warmer ocean currents, whereas the uh, general eastern side or western side of continents, you generally have cold currents. And this is very important in the type of weather that you would expect to see. And additionally, there's these equatorial countercurrents, which show an eastward flow beneath the north and south equatorial currents. And this is due uh, mainly due to this minimal Coriolis effect at the equator. And I'll give you a quick example of this. Uh, being out in a ship at one point in time, um, sailing there um, generally in the vicinity of these countercurrents, uh, the north or the equatorial countercurrent there, you can see it between the north equatorial and south equatorial current. Um, generally heading in the opposite direction of this current, uh, I can tell you from experience that it tends to slow things down when you're out in the water. Um, your, your speed of advance is much slower because the equatorial countercurrent is acting opposite. If I were to head west, for example, it's going to be um, resisting my forward motion and causing me to actually be slower than what I think I'm going. So just an interesting thought there. Additionally, we have these subpolar gyres. Um, I mentioned one was up in the Gulf of Alaska there where you see the Alaskan current is a relatively warmer current moving north. And then you get this colder current on the back side of that subpolar gyre rotation and that counterclockwise rotation where we typically see a lot of cyclones in the Gulf of Alaska. So that's the last one I will mention there. All right, so let's get in a little more discussion on these western boundary currents. Now when I say western boundary, again, I'm referring to the ocean basins themselves. So you have it almost like synonymous to a top of a hill of water. So uh, imagine that you have higher elevations um, and this water flows downhill displaced toward the west due to Earth's rotation. These western boundary currents are intensified in both hemispheres, by the way. They're faster, they're narrower, so they're not as wide. They're deeper and they're warmer. A good examples of these two, again, in the northern hemisphere would be the Gulf Stream Current uh, over the western Atlantic Ocean as well as the Kuroshio Current off the western, uh, western portion of the North Pacific Ocean. And this Coriolis effect contributes to the western intensification. Um, so Coriolis, remember as an example, I, I've given a previous training, Coriolis effect refers to uh, a turning to the right of the intended path of motion for um, wind or any object that's moving. 
is going to deflect to the right if it's a tenopath of motion in the northern hemisphere. That's an example that Coriolis was effect. Now, eastern boundary currents, they are located on the eastern side of these ocean basins, and they tend to have the opposite properties of the western boundary currents. So, you know, whereas the western boundary currents are faster, narrower, deeper, and warmer, look at the eastern boundary current there. They're colder, they run, they, they move slower, these currents. They're much shallower, so they don't go as far in depth below the ocean surface, and they're also wider. Here's a look at the boundary current summary. All right. Um, so, for example, the western boundary currents include the Gulf Stream and the Kuroshio Current in the Northern Hemisphere. These play a significant role in the development of um, extratropical cyclones, um, especially in the wintertime on the east coast of the United States where you get these storms known as nor'easters uh, that tend to form along the boundary between a much colder air over the North American continent and the much warmer water over the Gulf Stream Ocean Current. Uh, also in the Southern Hemisphere, an example of a Western Boundary Current would be the Brazilian Current. Again, there's the width, it's narrow, there's your depth, it goes fairly deep, and it is very fast. These Western Boundary Currents are fast moving, and they transport a lot of water, all right? And again, Western Boundary Currents. These are waters derived from lower latitudes. They're transporting that warmth northward. Eastern boundary currents, on the other hand, examples include the Canary Current. Uh, that would be off the coast of Spain, off the west, uh, northwest coast of Africa, as well as the California Current off the west coast of the United States there off California, as well as the Benguela Current in the southern hemisphere. Now, again, eastern boundary currents are wide. Uh, they're shallow. They, they're slower and they generally uh, transport much smaller volumes of water. And so, eastern boundary currents, water is derived from mid-latitudes and are cool. Coastal upwelling is also common, where you get the subsurface water to come rise up towards the surface as the top layer of water is, is basically blown away from the landmass. All right, so for now, ocean currents and the weather, or the climate. Warm ocean currents are going to warm the overlying air mass at the coast. So for example, if you live along the east coast of the United States, let's say from uh, you know Virginia southward, you really are going to have a modified um, effect of that warmer ocean current. It's going to result in warm, humid air in the summer season, and also you get a humid climate on adjoining landmass nearby here along the coast. Now, cool ocean currents, on the other hand, are going to cool the air at the coast, the overlying air mass. And cool, dry air, uh, you typically see a more marine layer in Southern California with these cool ocean currents, such as the California current, the eastern boundary current, and it's dry climate on adjoining landmass. As the wind blows from west to east in the middle latitudes over these cooler ocean currents, um, it's a much more stable air mass, which results in very little vertical lifting of the air and a drier climate. Here are the ocean water temperatures and the currents uh, as, as a whole, looking at the globe. Um, in general, we're showing you the top graphic shows August, and then the bottom graphic shows February, the month of February. So yes, you're going to have much different um, water temperatures in the oceans between um, late summer in August and then um, wintertime in February. And so, um, the winter hemisphere, those the colder water temperature is going to be closer or further down towards the equator as compared to the summertime. Uh, but in general, you can see the uh, the temperature ranges in degrees Celsius of these ocean currents here on this particular image. Just wanted to show you what it looked like as a whole between the seasons. As I mentioned earlier, the Antarctic circulation around this continent of Antarctica we have something that's known as the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. This is also known as a west wind drift and sometimes also can be known as a penguin gyre. It's, only, it's the only current in the world to completely encircle the Earth. There is no land masses in the way of this particular current. It moves more water than any other current. And so you take a look at the graphic on the right, shows the continent Antarctica, and generally it's going to move from west to east and uh, you can really get some stronger winds also at this location, sometimes known as the Roaring Forties, um, where you can get you know 40 degrees south latitude 
towards Antarctica, the winds are really blowing uh, a lot of time of the year because there's no land masses and no friction to slow those wind speeds down. So this current is a fairly strong current. In the Atlantic Ocean, let's, let's, let's take a look a little bit more now at a zoomed in version of the Atlantic Ocean circulation and the various currents. Uh, for the North Atlantic subtropical gyre there, um, again, it's composed of the North Equatorial Current, the Gulf Stream Current, the North Atlantic Current, the Canary Current on its east side, the South Equatorial Current, and the Atlantic Equatorial Counter Current. So this again just kind of shows you that, you know, we have this huge surplus of heat at the equator, and we have this heat deficit up at the polar areas, and in addition to the atmosphere creating storms to redistribute this heat from the equator to the poles, we also have these major ocean current circulations, which also transport a considerable amount of heat from low latitudes to high latitudes and tries to, these currents try to um, get rid of that imbalance of temperatures between the poles and the equator. All right, so looking at the South Atlantic subtropical gyre a little bit close up now, going to the Southern Hemisphere, uh, here is a look at what it's composed of, the Brazilian current, the Antarctic circumpolar current or the west wind drift, the Banguela current, which is off the uh, west coast of Africa, and then the um, south equatorial current. So it just gives you a look again um, at some of these features in the South Atlantic Ocean Circulation. The Gulf Stream Current coming closer to home in the United States, especially the East Coast. Uh, many of you may already be familiar with the importance of the Gulf Stream Current. It's the best studied of all ocean currents. It moves northward generally along the U.S. East Coast. And there are meanders and loops associated with the Gulf Stream Current. I'm going to show you an actual graphic of the current here in a moment. It does merge with the Sargasso Sea and circulates around the center of the North Atlantic gyre and has unique biology. So these meanders or loops uh, within the kind of offshoots of the Gulf Stream current may cause losses of water volume and generate what's known as these warm core and cold core rings. Now these warm core rings are known as warm core eddies, whereas these cold core rings are known as cold core eddies. So these are circular areas, these eddies, these loops that break off of the main Gulf Stream current um, in general. And I'll show you what this looks like here in a minute. But generally, warm core rings or eddies are, have the warmest water trapped in a loop surrounded by cooler water. So warm core rings think of the warmest water at the center. Cold core rings think of the coldest water at the center. And it has a unique biological populations whenever you have these eddies that develop. Here's a great look at the Gulf Stream current and the temperatures. Um, in general, the Gulf Stream on the left is shown in that the oranges and the red, the red shading, uh, that generally indicates that warmer, faster, more narrow uh, ocean current in the graphic on the left um, in general. And you have the cooler waters, by the way, and the graphic on the left are denoted by the purples and the blue shadings. The green is kind of that in-between point between um, the warmer waters to the south and the colder waters to the north. Now, if you can imagine this with weather, uh, generally storms are going to form and intensify based on temperature gradient or temperature contrasts. So the larger that temperature difference is, the more intense the storm system is going to be. If you look at the nor'easters that typically form off the east coast of the United States, they feed off this energy. Uh, of this large temperature contrast, especially in the winter time when you have much colder air masses over the land of North America and this uh, much warmer air mass over the warmer Gulf Stream current. So uh, hurricane tracks, um, you know, in addition to the subtropical high pressure system, the Bermuda High, um, the hurricanes tend to follow the path, hurricanes tend to follow the paths of least resistance, which typically are these warmer ocean surfaces. And this warm ocean surface as well can really help to intensify a warm core system such as a hurricane. So a lot of important things when we talk about the Gulf Stream and the weather. If you look at the graphic on the right, uh, we are showing you some examples of these warm core rings or eddies. They generally form uh, in the colder water north of the main Gulf Stream current. And then the cold core rings or the cold core eddies form uh, to the south of that main Gulf Stream current. 
And there's your direction and the graphic on the right of the warmer water moving from south, basically southwest and northeast off the southeast U.S. coast. And uh, yeah, can have some major implications, um, especially when it comes to winds um, and sea state off the east coast of the United States. Uh, for example, if you get a wind that opposes a current, if you have a wind blowing um, directly against the Gulf Stream current, you can get some major, major um, storm intensification and some very significant seas in a hurry. Looking at other currents that are associated uh, with the Atlantic Ocean Basin, look at this. This is known as a loop current. This is a warm ocean current that's situated in the Gulf of Mexico and it generates warm loop current eddies. You can see those uh, warm eddies there denoted by the circular rings in the orange uh, arrow shading. The uh, colder rings are denoted in the blue circular area or rings. But hurricanes generally tend, uh, tend to intensify when passing over these warm cores. A great example of this occurred in 2005 with Hurricane Katrina. As Katrina moved into the eastern Gulf of Mexico, Katrina passed over this loop current, this exceptionally warm water area, and just exploded in development. Um, so these play huge roles in some of the more rapid intensification hurricane cases that we've seen. Um, you know, tracks, general hurricane tracks are getting better in the forecasting. Uh, however, the intensity has always been a challenge. And when you have these kind of warm loop currents, that can really make a difference in rapid intensification. Other North Atlantic currents of note uh, include the Labrador Current, the Erminger Current, the Norwegian Current, as well as the North Atlantic Current. So in general, the climate effects of North Atlantic currents. By the way, if you are watching us from England, um, you have a much milder climate than uh, for your latitude than, say, somewhere else um, along that same parallel latitude because you have this North Atlantic current that generally is milder off your shores. And so northward moving currents in general are warm, Gulf Stream warms east coast of the United States and also Northern Europe. Northern Europe, again, including England, is warmer than uh, most locations for that latitude due to this moderate, moderating effect of the warmer ocean currents. The North Atlantic and Norwegian currents warm Northwestern Europe in general. The southward moving currents generally are cooler. Um, examples in the Atlantic include the Labrador Current, which cools Eastern Canada, it flows right along the East Coast of Canada, and the Canary Current, um, the cools North African coast. And so as far as the weather goes, again, with the Labrador current, um, whenever you have a warmer, moist, maritime tropical air mass moving over that much cooler Labrador current in the summer season, for example, off of um, New England and uh, Nova Scotia, Halifax, those areas, you generally get thick fogs, thick sea fogs over those locations uh, in the summertime. Um, in the Canary Current as well, you, you can get some fog, as well as you tend to get more layered stratocumulus clouds or stratus clouds. Indian Ocean Circulation, that Indian Ocean Subtropical Gyre includes the Agujas Current, the Australian Current, as well as the Leeuwin Current. And then the Pacific Ocean Circulation, uh, this is, you know, we're looking at the, the currents that um, fall under that North Pacific subtropical gyre. These include the Kuroshio Current, very important, especially for Western Pacific typhoons. The North Pacific Current, the California Current, very important to the weather of California. The North Equatorial Current, as well as the Alaskan Current. The South Pacific subtropical gyre is composed of the East Australian Current, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, the Peruvian cur Current, sometimes also known as the Humboldt Current, the South Equatorial Current, as well as the Equatorial Power Current. So let's take a look here at the Pacific Ocean circulation in general. Um, again, the um, flow of the currents in accordance with the circulation around these subtropical gyres, these high pressure systems, um, is generally clockwise in the Northern Hemisphere and counterclockwise in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, generally, you get these the red arrows indicate warmer currents, the blue arrows, the higher latitudes of the colder currents. Um, so for example, in the Southern Hemisphere, um, along the East Coast of Australia, you have a warmer East Australian current. Uh, that flows from uh, West to East, 
and becomes the west wind drift at Antar Antarctic Circumpolar Current. And then that, that turns north uh, around the high pressure of subtropical high there in the southern hemisphere becomes a Peruvian current, which is a colder current, which flows from uh, the colder waters to, uh, towards the equator. And then you have the southeastern trade winds once more, um, the SE lettering there, uh, southeast trade wind, south equatorial current. In the northern hemisphere in the Pacific, you generally have the cold California current off the coast of California. That then transitions clockwise to more of a north equatorial current, the NE lettering. And in the western Pacific, we have K, the Kuroshio current. And then that becomes a North Pacific current. So these currents play a significant role on the general circulation of the atmosphere. All right, so speaking of the circulation, where the ocean and atmosphere come together across the Pacific Ocean, this cannot be overstated enough. We have many teleconnections out in the Pacific Ocean that have a significant bearing on the weather downstream um, from the westerlies, generally towards the United States. Uh, we have the El Nino Southern Oscillation. We have, um, in general, the Manjulian Oscillation, uh, East Pacific Ductal Oscillation. So we have PDO. Uh, we also have what's known as a Walker Circulation Cell. Now, when we see the Walker Circulation Cell, this is normal. We have air pressure across the Equatorial Pacific. It's generally higher in the Eastern Pacific as compared to the Western Pacific. You get stronger Southeast trade winds in this situation. You get a Pacific warm pool of water on the western sides of the ocean. And you also get a deeper, what's known as a thermocline, on the western side of the ocean basin as well. The upwelling off the coast of Peru is also fairly normal. And, you know, the fishing industry is very dependent upon this upwelling condition. What the upwelling does is it brings colder subsurface waters to the surface, but it also brings a lot of... Um, a lot of nutrients with it as it rises to the surface. So this tr attracts a lot of fish. And um, that's one of the bigger uh, industries is, you know, the economy of countries like Peru, they rely heavily on these fish. And so this is a normal situation most of the time. Here's what it looks like graphically. And generally, you have the coldest water and higher pressure in the eastern Pacific Ocean. And then you have... Uh, warmer water and lower pressure in the western Pacific Ocean. Now this is what would normally occur. And you notice the arrow there in the lower right, you have uh, upwelling where that colder subsurface water comes to the top of the ocean. And in general, you look at the green, the green arrows there in this, this diagram, um, that is your walker circulation cell, which ties not only from the surface, but aloft above the ground. So in general, we have higher pressure and that wind is directed from east to west, um, toward that area of low pressure in the Western Pacific. With the warmer water, you get a lot more instability and rising air motion, development of clouds and showers and thunderstorms. And the air rises and then it returns aloft back to Western North America and then sinks again at the high pressure areas. All right. Um, look at the bottom of this diagram too. You generally see the coldest water and then um, the warmest water above that. Okay, and how it changes in depth between the Western Pacific and the Eastern Pacific. Now, that's normal. That's a normal walker circulation cell. But what happens when that walker circulation cell is disrupted? We have a condition that is well documented, and it's known as the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Sometimes it's abbreviated ENSO. Now, the, when the walker circulation is disrupted, you get high pressure in the Eastern Pacific that weakens not as strong as it normally would be. You get weaker trade winds as a result. You have less of a pressure gradient from high pressure in the eastern Pacific towards the low pressure in the western Pacific. Um, and then you get warm pools of water which migrate eastward in areas that are normally dominated by cooler water. The thermocline becomes deeper in the eastern Pacific and you get an opposite effect of the upwelling. It's known as downwelling. And you also get that lower fish uh, activity, lower biological productivity. And the Peruvian fishing industry suffers when you get this walker cell circulation disrupted. Here's what El Nino Southern Oscillation looks like. Okay, So now, if you notice the normal walker circulation, we had high pressure in the eastern Pacific. 
That's replaced now by low pressure in the Eastern Pacific. All right. The other changes you'll note, normal walker circulation, you get that low pressure in the Western Pacific. Well, now it's replaced by high pressure in the Western, Pac Western Pacific. So a big difference. You also notice the wind direction is changed. In the normal walker circulation with high pressure in the Eastern Pacific, low pressure in the Western Pacific, you normally would have a east to west flow of wind circulation, but now with ENSO, El Nino, you generally have a um, wind direction from higher to lower pressure moving from west to east instead. So this is a big difference. So now we get rising air motion over the Eastern Pacific area. <clears throat> we get sinking air motion in the Western Pacific. So we get more um, unsettled weather, showers and storms in the Eastern Pacific, and less in the way of precipitation in the Western Pacific when you have these El Nino conditions. Now this is a strong El Nino example, by the way. Okay. So El Nino Southern Oscillation, generally what, what does El Nino look like? If you look at the maroon shading there in the just off the coast of South America in the Eastern Pacific, Notice the orange and that maroon shading that indicates well above normal sea surface temperatures. You can see the scale there at the bottom, um, sometimes in excess of 4 degrees Celsius above normal. And this whole change in the dynamics in the Pacific Ocean play a significant role in the weather of the United States. La Nina is the opposite of El Nino. And now this, this takes place when you get increased pressure differences across the equatorial Pacific. You get stronger trade winds during La Nina episodes, and you also get stronger upwelling in the eastern Pacific Ocean, shallower thermoclines, and then you get these cooler than normal seawater with, with higher biological productivity. Here's an example of the circulation associated with La Nina. Generally, you have a colder water in the eastern uh, equatorial Pacific and much warmer water in the western equatorial Pacific. And your storminess and thunderstorms, um, some cases, tropical cyclone development occurs in the Western Pacific Ocean Basin. You have a general high pressure uh, over the East Central Pacific and lower pressure over the Western Pacific. And so there's a big change and increased upwelling is also taking place during La Nina, which definitely helps the biological productivity, the fishing industry, the Peruvian economy. But if you look at this, again, major differences. Here's El Nino. Here's La Nina, so big changes. And in fact, we are, um, Climate Prediction Center is forecasting um, La Nina to return this winter um, across the Northern Hemisphere. So that's something to keep an eye on as far as the weather patterns as well as the teleconnections associated with such cooler than normal water. Here's a look of actual sea surface temperature map from January 2000. And look at the dark blue coloring. That indicates uh, much um, that dark blue coloring there west of South America over the uh, eastern and central equatorial Pacific. Um, we're looking at 3 to 4 degrees Celsius below normal water temperatures, and that is the example of um, La Nina. So what's this occurrence, what, what is the occurrence of ENSO events, El Nino Southern Oscillation events? El Ninos generally are the warm phase of the ENSO cycle. They occur about every 2 to 10 years. They're highly irregular with phases usually lasting 12 to 18 months. And we look back at 10,000 year sediment record of events um, to try to reconstruct the past climate. Um, El Nino Southern Oscillation may also be part of the Pacific, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the PDO, which is a long-term natural climate cycle as well, which lasts in the order of 20 to 30 years. Here is a graphic of the ENSO phases now the red shading, the red spikes indicate the El Nino, the blue spikes indicate the La Nina, and you notice over time, now we're going back to 1950 here, and so you can see there's a lot of, um, there's like a cyclical nature to this between the warmer El Nino phase and the cooler La Nina phase and how they flip back and forth. Um, so for example, in 1955 we had a strong La Nina. Um, additionally, in the early 1970s, you know, 73 to 76, another strong La Nina. And then we had a strong La Nina as recent as 2010, 2011. So you can take a look at that and note those. On the other hand, El Ninos have been very, very strong. If you look at the year 1983 in particular, um, we had uh, 
index of three for the El Nino. Look how tall that red spike is there around 1983. And another major spike there, 1997, 98 time period. Those were some of the more significant El Ninos uh, on record. So El Nino and La Nina, what they do for the weather in general, um, you know, for El Nino, you typically see uh, a much more active subtropical jet stream. Uh, you typically get a more southern storm track across the United States with El Nino. Um, you generally tend to be cooler as well from uh, California, which gets lots of winter rain, all the way across to the southeastern U.S. Florida is, has a cooler than normal winter in this case during the El Nino phases. Um, La Nina is completely opposite, you know, and, and, and these temperature changes and the, the disruption of the walker circulation also ties into the atmospheric circulation as a whole um, with the jet stream taking on different configurations across the Pacific Ocean as a result of uh, El Nino versus La Nina teleconnections, all right? Um, in general, though, this is what happens uh, during severe El Niños, you can also get drought and wildfires, which dominate in Indonesia and Australia. Uh, you get more tropical storms, uh, more frequency in the middle eastern Pacific. Uh, coral is bleached in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, you also get flooding that can occur in coastal South America. And during El Nino, you get Atlantic hurricanes, which are suppressed because with a, a stronger subtropical jet stream, you get um, increased wind shear with El Nino across the tropical Atlantic, uh, the lower latitudes, which tends to rip apart the thunderstorms. Here's a look at comparison between El Nino and La Nina temperatures, uh, just again showing you the major differences in the temperature anomalies above normal water with El Nino. The graphic on the left is January 1998, which was one of those significant El Nino years I'm showing here. Um, and then look at the graphic on the right, that's the January 1999 La Nina event. Uh, with much cooler than normal water there along the eastern Pacific. All right, now that we've talked about surface currents and some of the teleconnection, weather, atmosphere, the ocean atmosphere connection, now let's talk about these deep ocean currents. Uh, these are dominated predominantly by what's known as a thermal haline circulation. When you see therm, yeah, I want you to think of temperature, and when you see haline, I want you to think of salinity differences or the salt content of the water. So a thermal haline circulation, we not only have these surface ocean currents, but we also have a three-dimensional circulation which, which extends to the deep parts of the ocean. And this therm, deep ocean circulation, um, driven by temperature and density differences of water, is known as a thermal haline circulation. Uh, it's typically below what's known as the pycnocline. 90% um, of all ocean water is within this circulation, and it generally has a slow velocity. Generally, thermal haline circulation is going to originate in the higher latitudes uh, surface ocean area. The water there is cooled, it becomes more dense, and that surface water wants to sink because it, as it's cooled, it, it gets heavier, it sinks, and, and, and then we get these deep water masses which are identified on what's known as temperature salinity diagrams. So we talked about thermal haline, again I want you to think about temperature and salinity properties. Um, and this temperature salinity diagram is going to identify deep water masses based on the temperature salinity and that resulting density. Some of the deep water masses associated with the thermal haline circulation include Antarctic bottom water, the North Atlantic deep water, the Antarctic intermediate water, as well as the oceanic common water. In general, cold surface seawater sinks at the polar areas as it moves equatorward beneath the surface. Here's a great look at the uh, thermal haline circulation, sometimes also known as a conveyor belt circulation. Um, generally, you see um, the purple circles there at the higher latitudes. Let's just use the North Atlantic, for example. Um, there between Greenland and uh, northeastern Canada, there's a purple circle there. There's another purple circle there um, to the um, northeast of Iceland, to the east of Greenland. Those are the source areas for deep currents, which occur in the North Atlantic. Those purple circular areas are where the surface water is so cool that it's heavier and denser and it wants to sink. Um, it wants to sink lower in the ocean, below the ocean surface, and becomes high density. Okay? So as a result, you see the blue shading there in the Atlantic Ocean, the arrow there. That's showing that deep 
cool water moving back towards the equator beneath the maroon, the pinkish shading, which is the warmer ocean currents that flow on top of that. So we have a warm, shallow current uh, overrunning a cold and salty deep current. And these conveyor belt circulations uh, it shows a continuous flow of water through the source areas to deep currents, the blue bands, and the returning surface currents are the red bands. Um, so this is a major, major circulation system. Uh, for example, down near Antarctica in the southern hemisphere, surface water is going to cool in those purple circular areas down there by Antarctica at the bottom of the diagram. And very similar to the North Atlantic sink, creates some of the densest water in the world there um, off Antarctica. So in general, these are very important. The thermal halion circulation is very important. And there's been a lot of news lately about how possibly the Gulf Stream current in the Atlantic, North Atlantic Ocean, may actually be weakening. Um, I don't know if you and many of you have watched the movie The Day After Tomorrow, A Day After Tomorrow, but, um, you know, we kind of laugh at those movies and kind of think to ourselves, you know, yeah, right, that's not really going to happen. But with global warming, um, you know, we're having more fresh water melt in the northern latitudes, especially off the Greenland ice sheets. And, uh, you know, the properties, the salinity, if I'm adding more fresh water up in the northern latitudes, I'm now um, decreasing or lowering my salinity values, right? I'm adding more fresh water off these melting ice sheets. And that ultimately, in the long run, could play a significant role in the speed, the velocity, uh, the general motion, direction these currents end up. Um, you know, right now we have a warm Gulf Stream current off the eastern United States. But in the future, if global warming continues, um, it's very possible those circulations could change. This whole thermal halion circulation may completely change. And that will have a huge implication on our planetary weather. And, and you know, we're all one world and one globe, and we all are connected in one way or another through the atmospheric circulation and through these oceanic conveyor belts. And so it's definitely something to keep in mind. All right, that wraps things up tonight. That is my last slide on the ocean and the weather. Um, I haven't really talked much about the teleconnections outside of the ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Talked about the uh, Walker circulation, um, but there's also other um, very important oscillations, especially in the Pacific Ocean, that have huge bearings on the weather across North America during the winter season. Um, especially when we talk about the quasi-biennial oscillation or QBO, and that is a change in the winds aloft uh, from the east to west direction above the equator, actually up in the second layer of the atmosphere, the stratosphere. That's another major um, oscillation in the Pacific that can really play significant roles in shaping our weather, especially during the winter season in the northern hemisphere. Um, it, it changes these, these circulations and uh, these oscillations change the configurations of the jet stream overall, and that plays a significant role in, in whether we're going to have a warmer or colder winter, a wetter or drier winter. Um, you know, it, it plays significantly. You, know, you wouldn't think so by looking at the Pacific Ocean. If you live on the east coast of the U.S., for example, you're thinking, that's way far away from me. Why should I be concerned about what's going on in the Pacific Ocean? Well, weather and the general upper-level winds move blow from west to east, and so that is going to have an impact on our weather. All right. All right. Thank you so much for watching this video on the ocean and the weather. I hope you really got some good uh, information out of the training tonight. Um, in general, uh, I'm, I'm leaning towards my next video, uh, maybe going towards more of the teleconnections again. Um, just get an explanation of the teleconnections. Um, and then, uh, again, our winter weather outlook will be coming up in October, as well as uh, I plan to resume the weekly teleconnection discussions uh, in the fall as well. So there's a lot to look forward to. Um, if you're new to the channel, thanks again for watching for the first time, as well as our returning subscribers. Um, really appreciate the support, and hopefully uh, you're learning more and more every day here uh, from Spot on Weather. All right, that wraps things up. Everybody have a great, pleasant evening, and God bless.